The reason that it's important is how we understand that monotheism arose has a bearing on whether or not we believe the scriptures are true. Okay, so the scriptures represent to us a, a, a way uh, that monotheism arose, and and there's a very and there are some very prevalent ideas within the culture and society that are at odds with that, and so we need to be able to to answer people's questions when it comes to this question or, or, or their ideas or their thoughts of how do we get monotheism. Today there aren't, you won't find many scholars that will, will explicitly defend this particular view or this particular model. All right? And you'll see some reasons why in a minute. So, but it still kind of remains kind of the assumption behind the way a lot of people think. All right? So there's just this very common assumption today that religion developed and we arrived at monotheism through this particular uh, evolutionary process. Welcome to this class of Persuasive Faith. I'm Rick Harvey, the teacher here in our local church. In this series of lessons, we are exploring the credibility of the Christian faith. If you find this lesson helpful, don't forget to hit the like button. And if you want to make sure you see future lessons, be sure to subscribe. If you would like a copy of the slide notes from this class, there's a link in the description below. Now, today's class. Okay, so we are in worldviews. We're thinking about the whole area of worldviews. We'll be doing that for the next few weeks. And today I want to talk about the subject of theism and then talk a little bit about uh, about deism. And, uh, and I have there basically the same list of recommended readings that I gave you last week, uh, but I did add one uh, there, uh, Cordowin's, uh book, Neighboring Face, which I had on there last week, but he also has a book which relates a lot to what we're talking about today, which is In the Beginning God. Uh, and uh, so that's just one more, one more on your list of recommended resources. So when I'm talking about theism as a worldview, I'm talking specifically about monotheism, okay? Uh, uh, sometimes other uh, writers or thinkers or scholars will include other things with theism other than monotheism, but I'm focused just primarily on monotheism today, and of course the three primary monotheistic religions or worldviews are Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, which of course appeared historically in that order. Uh, and they really make up, particularly uh, Christianity and Islam, make up about 60 to 65 percent or so of the world's population. So this really is the dominant worldview uh, across the world. Uh, and as I mentioned, some, some writers, some scholars also include polytheism with theism because, of course, polytheism is the idea of many gods, and so they include it with theism. Uh, but I don't do that. Uh, one of the reasons I don't is because polytheism, although it does have a belief in, in a god or gods, it's really the worldview is really radically different than a monotheistic worldview. It really fits into another category uh, that we'll explore uh, later when we get into uh, monism. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is there's just tremendous variety among theists, of course. So, I mean, if you just look at that list, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, just right there alone, you can see that there's tremendous Variety. So when I describe theism, I'm describing it in a general sense, and you'll always find exceptions among theists uh, at various points. So uh, just keep that in mind. So if we if we take 
uh, James Sire's eight questions that we talked about last week, the eight questions you can ask of a worldview, uh, and we apply that to theism. Uh, the first question was, uh, his first question was, what is prime reality or ultimate reality? And of course, for the theist, that is a monotheistic God. In other words, it is a God whom theists believe is the only God. There is no other God. Um, uh, secondly, most theists believe that that God is uh, personal. He has personality or personhood. Uh, they believe that the God that that God is knowable in some sense, although not completely knowable because he's so great, so infinite, or whatever. Uh, he, we can't know him completely, but we can know true things about him. Now, the exception to that, as we'll see uh, next week, we're going to start. We're going to take a couple weeks and look at Islam, and we're going to see that in Islam they don't believe that God is truly knowable in the sense that you can really know accurately things about him and you'll will I'll explain that later as we uh, when we get into Islam but but typically theists believe that God is infinite that he's uh, transcendent but not only is he transcendent but at the same time he's also imminent also he's in other words he's very, he's present he's nearby all right so it's not, not just that God transcends creation, transcends nature, transcends time, and transcends space, but there is also some sense in which God is very present or very near, and this is very characteristic of uh, theism. So God is omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's eternal, he's perfectly good, he's loving, all of these things are characteristic of the way theists view, uh, view God. And then when it comes to the nature of external reality, everything other than God, uh, typically atheists believe that, that uh, the material world is, is real, it really exists, and that at least uh, in some sense it's good, or at least it was originally good, that it was created by God, but that in some sense also it, it has been impacted in some way, so it has been in some way been corrupted. So it, it began good, still has good qualities, and yet in some ways it has been uh, it has been diminished or it has been uh, corrupted in some way. Okay, uh, what is the nature of humanness? And of course, as we've already talked about, theism views uh, human nature as being dualistic; that we are made up uh, of uh, material aspect, our bodies but that we also have this kind of immaterial aspect to us, a soul or a spirit or uh, something to that effect, effect uh, that there is some degree of alienation between us and God, uh, which most theists view as a product of some kind of sin or some kind of offense against God. Uh, <clears throat> after death, most theists believe that there is some kind of ongoing life after death and that that ongoing, ongoing life has a real continuity with the life before death. So as opposed to the idea of reincarnation, where in reincarnation in, in Eastern religions, uh, there's, there's an ongoing existence after death, but there's really no awareness or continuity with, with uh, the existence before death. In theism, there's a very clear continuity. There's an awareness of the after-death person of the pre-death person. Uh, and, and a very uh, strong continuity. There's also believed to be after death some degree or some kind of accountability uh, or judgment for the actions that we uh, uh, the actions that we performed in life, and um, and that also this this afterlife existence is either going to be somehow in the presence of God in heaven or something like that, uh, or it, it's going to be, uh, the life will be in some sense separated from God, uh, very likely as a, as a result of the accountability that we just mentioned, some kind of punishment for sin. So this is common across most of theistic worldviews. Then the question is, how can we know anything? Uh, and, and within theism, the idea of reason and the idea of rationality is rooted in the idea that God is, as we said, a personal being with, with rationality and with reason. And that he actually uh, created us with that 
capacity ourselves. So just as he is reasonable and rational, he has created us with the ability to think, to reason, uh, and <clears throat> to be rational. How do we know right from wrong? Well, uh, here again, God is the source of objective moral duties and obligations. Uh, so our duties and obligations are objective in the sense that they're outside of us, they're sourced in God, and that God has imparted that knowledge to us, that he has given to human beings this knowledge of good and evil. And he's done this in two ways. One, he's done it through, our, through the conscience which he's instilled in us, and he has also uh, made us capable of knowing good and evil through reasoning, uh, but even more primarily, he does this through revelation. So uh, each one of the major theistic uh, worldviews, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, of course, all have their scriptures. They have their books of revelation through which God has disclosed uh, to mankind uh, what their obligations and duties are. Uh, in a theism... Uh, history is linear as opposed to being cyclical or eternal. So there are worldviews in which history is viewed as this kind of cycle that just keeps repeating itself over and over again. So history is really just eternal. Uh, it has no beginning, it has no end, it has no real teleos, it has no purpose to it. Uh, whereas with uh, theism, history is linear, it has a very definite beginning point and it has something that it's moving to. It has a teleos, okay? And that history is the fulfillment of God's purpose. So, so the monotheistic God has some purpose or some reason for human history and for how human history is unfolding. And then uh, the eighth point, what are, what are the personal life-oriented commitments that are implied by this? Well, for, for most theists, they recognize that, that we were made to be in relationship with God, and that entails, as far as our commitments are concerned, it entails that we would obey God and that we would worship God. Okay? So these are, these are just, uh, this is just a very general description of how most theists view reality and how they think about reality. But, but a really important question comes up in... And how did theism, or specifically how did monotheism arise? How did we get here? Okay, And this actually turns out to be a very important question. And the reason, uh, the reason that it's important is how we understand that monotheism arose has a bearing on whether or not we believe the scriptures are true. Okay, So... The scriptures represent to us a, a way uh, that monotheism arose, and and there's a very and there are some very prevalent ideas within the culture and society that are at odds with that, and so we need to be able to to answer people's questions when it comes to this question or or their ideas or their thoughts when it comes to this question of how do we get monotheism? All right. And one of the very prevalent ideas regarding uh, the development of monotheism is what we could call the evolutionary model of religion. So the question that people ask is, why are people religious? Why do people have religions? And why specifically are some people, for example, polytheists, and some are animists, and some are, uh, some are monotheists? Why is that true? Okay, uh, and so there is uh, one model, one way of explaining this or accounting for this is what's called the evolutionary model, uh, which I also have the, the word Darwinian in there because in one sense it's very similar to Darwinian thoughts about the evolution of life uh, and uh, uh, of the species, okay? And you'll see why here in a minute. So. This actual, this idea, this evolutionary model has been uh, very popular among us, uh, ethnologists, anthropologists, and people like that, particularly in the 19th uh, and the 20th century. It was really uh, pretty common. Uh, 
Today, there aren't, you won't find many scholars that will, will explicitly defend this particular view or this particular model, all right? And you'll see some reasons why in a minute. So they won't really explicitly defend it, but it still kind of remains kind of the assumption behind the way a lot of people think, all right? So there's just this very common assumption today that religion developed and we arrived at monotheism through this particular uh, evolutionary process. And so when people are thinking about religion today or they're trying to explain religion today, oftentimes they'll fall back on this evolutionary model even though scholars today are, are not real eager to try to overtly defend it or explicitly defend it. And particularly you'll run into this with when you're talking to an atheist. Because an atheist, uh, most atheists are of course uh, in gen generally speaking are Darwinians and they believe in evolution and that sort of thing and, and they believe there is no spiritual reality. So they have to somehow account for why are the vast overwhelming majority of people in the world, why are they religious? If, if there is no God, how do you explain the fact that that probably 95% or more of the world are religious in some sense and the vast majority of them are monotheists. How do you account for that? How do you explain that? Uh, well, one, one way you explain it then is by this kind of evolutionary model uh, that kind of fits in with, uh, with Darwinism and with other, with other ideas about evolution. Um, and also, one reason it's important we be familiar with this, and we'll come back to it again when we get into our module on the Bible, is because this model has had a significant impact on how people interpret the Bible. So particularly when we get into the Old Testament, and particularly when we get to the Pentateuch. So, uh, so there was a very popular theory, the Wellhausen theory, uh, or the Wellhausen hypothesis, sometimes it's called the JDP hypothesis or the documentary hypothesis about the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, okay? And, uh, and that, whole, that whole hypothesis was predicated on this evolutionary model of the development of religion. And this, mod, this uh, hypothesis is used to discount the historicity of the first five books of the Bible and to discount the mosaic authorship of those books, okay? So it really, goes to the, it really goes to the authority of Scripture and the credibility of Scripture. And this evolutionary model of the development of religion underlies and is the foundation for this whole Wellhausen theory. So we'll come back to that particular thing, as I mentioned, when we get to our module on the Bible. Um, but there are several assumptions that lie behind this model. And one is that religion is fully human in its origin. So religion doesn't, uh, orig religion doesn't ori uh, or originate with a transcendent God reaching out to man uh, and, and communicating with man, but religion is totally this kind of human creation. It's the product of uh, human culture. So culture is what shapes religion rather than religion being the primary thing that shapes our, our culture. And this is, all, uh, this is all, as I say, a part of the assumption of the presuppositions that underlie the evolutionary uh, model. So the idea then is, uh, in studying religion, the whole idea of a real spiritual reality kind of uh, redundant there, but a, a spiritual reality uh, beyond the religion or to which the religion addresses itself is discounted and religion is strictly studied from a human perspective. And you may even have, you may even have theistic or Christian or religious scholars who have a religious belief, but when they study religion, they study it from this methodological naturalism. They study it from this perspective of not taking into account the spiritual dimension and only taking into account the human dimension. So this underlies this whole approach uh, to religion. And then the idea is that religion would have begun at a very primitive level. So the earliest religions would be very, very primitive, and then as 
cultures and societies advanced, then religion advanced along with that and became more sophisticated and more complex uh, and that sort of thing. So this whole idea of religion begins at this very elementary childlike level and advances as culture and society advances. Okay, And so if you think about it, then you'll notice that this really fits kind of hand in glove with the whole Darwinian idea, right? So the whole Darwinian theory is life begins at this, you know, at this very simple uh, microbe level, and then over a period of time it develops and it gets more uh, sophisticated and life becomes more complex. So as it turns out, as this evolutionary model was becoming very popular, this kind of coincides uh, directly with the rise of Darwinism in the middle of the 19th century. So you have Darwinism becoming very, very popular uh, in the latter part of the 19th century and at the same time this evolutionary model just kind of works along with Darwinism, although when you think about it there's no direct connection between uh, between the evolutionary model and Darwinism. Darwinism just simply has to do with, uh, with living things, uh, with uh, living organisms and that sort of thing and, this, and the progress or development of living organisms, whereas religion has more to do with an idea or, or, or a, a way of thinking. Uh, so the idea then is that, that the more advanced your culture is, the more advanced your society is, the more advanced and sophisticated uh, your religion is going to be, um, so that if you if you go back and you look at places around the world where societies and cultures are less developed and more primitive, so if you go into places like Aboriginal areas in Australia, or if you go into places like uh, New Guinea and places like that where you find very primitive tribes, what you would expect to find then, and the assumption is that what you will find is these very primitive, very elementary childlike religions. Okay, So these are the assumptions that lie behind the evolutionary model. So uh, I always like to think visually, and so, uh, so I created a graph here, it doesn't come out in your notes, but uh, if you think about it then here along the along the x-axis of our graph, uh, as time progresses with a culture or society, you get material development, right? So a society uh, from, from earliest time up till modern times, you see this kind of slow but relentless progress materially. Uh, societies and cultures become more sophisticated, more technological, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, along the y-axis then, we would have as you go up the y-axis, you would have increasing levels of religious sophistication or religious complexity. Okay, So the idea then with the evolutionary model is that as you move along time, as cultures get more and more sophisticated, more and more materially advanced, that, that you're going to be moving up in your religious sophistication or, or the, uh, the complexity and sophistication of your religion so that it starts at the various early stages and in the earliest cult cultures with mana moves up to animism then polytheism then henotheism and then ultimately finally we achieve monotheism and of course most atheists assume that as culture advances now we're going to move from monotheism up to what? What comes after monotheism? Pardon? Atheism. atheism, right. So that's how, that's how, how most atheists would think. Okay. Um, so uh, just to define our terms a little bit there. So the idea is that initially uh, when mankind was first, uh, when first man first evolved from the apes or whatever, uh, in the very earliest stages uh, and they're, uh, you know, they're just learning to make fire and all that sort of thing, uh, you have what is called mana. And uh, mana is just kind of an awareness of some kind of spiritual force in nature. So there's just this idea that you have this, this mana, this spiritual force that just kind of inhabits nature. It's not personalized in any sense. It's just this kind of awareness that there's a spiritual force out there. Uh, so there's a tendency then to worship uh, 
various objects. Uh, so this is what we call fetishism. So oftentimes with mana, you'll have an element of fetishism, which is the worship of inanimate objects. So you would see, for example, the worship of the sun or the worship of the moon, okay? Not as though they are personal beings or that there's some personal being in the sun, but just that there's this kind of, they, 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 they just contain this kind of spiritual force, okay? And of course, you could see where this would sound very reasonable because primitive people are very much, you know, they're just very much at the mercy of nature, right? They're, you know, it's just survival of the fittest in a real sense uh, in relationship to nature and, and how, how it rains or doesn't rain or whether the sun shines or it doesn't shine. These are things they're all really at the mercy of. And so, so there's a real sense that there's something spiritual out there that's affecting their lives, and they're trying to figure out how can I influence those spiritual forces in, in order to survive and prosper. Uh, but then as the culture becomes a little more sophisticated, then uh, according to this model, uh, animism develops. And in animism then, this kind of spiritual force in nature takes on a real personal aspect to it. So then you begin to have these kind of nature spirits. So then there's actually, uh, there's actually this idea that there's a, there is a personal spirit then that inhabits these different parts of uh, nature. So, uh, so there's a spirit in the trees, or there's a spirit in the river, or the spirit in the, tree, in the, in the sky, and, and, and that sort of thing. And also along with this, oftentimes you'll encounter uh, ancestor worship. I was just watching a, uh, I was just watching a, a, a program on PBS yesterday uh, talking about a particular festival in uh, Guatemala. Uh, and this entire festival is a fantastic festival and very fascinating, but the entire thing was basically focused on the idea of of honoring your uh, honoring your ancestors uh, uh, and and communicating with your ancestors and that's when it wasn 't strictly ancestor worship in the sense that we would think of worship, but very closely related to that so in animism, you get this idea that there are actual personal spirits which inhabit nature and, uh, and the idea that your ancestors are out there and, and you, worship your, uh, you worship your ancestors' spirits. And then as that becomes more and more sophisticated, uh, those spirits then take on the form of deity. So you get uh, polytheism. So the spirits then are now kind of elevated to, the, to this kind of level of being what we would think of today as a god, all right? And of course, the most extreme example of polytheism would be Hinduism, where you have something like 30 million different gods, okay? Uh, but then you have many other uh, forms of uh, polytheism. Basically, the whole idea then, poly meaning many, is just that there are many deities out there, and you have to figure out what deities are in charge of what things and how you relate to those deities and how you can appease those deities or seek their favor or uh, all that sort of thing. And eventually as society develops and becomes more sophisticated and society itself begins to develop a hierarchy and you begin to get governors and kings and people like that, then that gets projected onto the deities and the deities begin to take on a hierarchy, all right? Uh, and then ultimately, one deity takes precedence over all the other deities. So you still have a form of polytheism, but in this case, you have, you have, a, uh, you have one of the deities is kind of the preeminent deity, all right? So a classic example of this, of course, would be in the Greek pantheon. So in the Greek pantheon, uh, Zeus is the number one, okay? And the others are under him. In, uh, in the Roman pantheon, of course, it's Jupiter, and he's, the, he's kind of the head god over all the other gods. So that's uh, henotheism. And then ultimately, as society becomes more and more complex and more and more developed, ultimately it moves on to monotheism. All the other gods are shed aside, and you just have one ultimate god who demands allegiance to himself to the exclusion of all other gods. So this is the idea then of the evolutionary model. But there are some significant problems with the evolutionary model when you start to look at the data, when the research is done and you are actually start uh, compiling the data. And, and 
the, one of the major problems is you just don't observe this process. Okay, so as scholars study both contemporary cultures, uh, uh, both modern and primitive contemporary cultures as well as cultures from the past, uh, this particular process uh, is not this kind of clear-cut development that the model suggests. So, for one thing, they do see changement. They see movement in societies uh, in their religious beliefs, but it goes in both directions. It doesn't just go in this kind of relentless upward direction towards monotheism, uh, but it goes in uh, both directions. So, uh, and one of the reasons they see this is because there's there are no examples in uh, from the study of cultural history, as they study the history of cultures from the past, or when they study uh, existing cultures around the world, whether it's modern America or some primitive tribe in New Guinea or whatever, uh, when they look at these, they don't see this evolutionary development. Okay, it's just, it's not in the records, it's just not there. Um, and one of the other things that's interesting is, generally speaking, material regression is never really observed. When, as a society develops materially, it just it develops, it gets there, it kind of secures that bit, not bit of knowledge or technology, and then it moves on and, 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 it, and it continues to improve. It doesn't regress, regress backwards. So you don't have modern cultures going back to, to, to uh, cavemen type thing, okay? So that's not observed with material progression, but it is observed with religious development and religious changes. So while you don't have material regression, you do have religious regression if you're thinking in terms of the model here and, and the movement from mana up to polytheism as being progress. You do see regression back down the line, even as culture continues to progress, all right? Um, so, for example, uh, Ronald Stark in his book, uh, The Triumph of Christianity, says this. He says, compared with the distant, mysterious, awesome, demanding, and difficult to comprehend God presented by monotheists, people often seemed more comfortable with gods that were less awe-inspiring and more human, less demanding and more permissive gods who were easily propitiated with sacrifices. These preferences help to explain the very frequent backsliding from monotheism into idolatry that took place both in ancient Israel and in Persia. So of course in ancient Israel you have monotheism, in Persia you had monotheism in the form of Zoroastrianism, uh, and, but in both those cases as the culture would, or the society would move into monotheism, become monotheistic, but then it would move back. It would regress back into uh, polytheistic, or as he calls, uh, idol uh, idolatrous religion, okay? Uh, so so this, this progress, this kind of relentless progress of religion just isn't observed uh, in the data. Uh, secondly, even today, in some very advanced cultures, technologically, uh, scientifically advanced cultures, we see, still see these so-called primitive religions, right? So, for example, take Japan. So in Japan, you have a very, very highly industrialized, modern, technological, scientific, uh, and culturally advanced society and yet the predominant religion in Japan is Shintoism, all right? And Shintoism is kind of a blend of animism and polytheism, all right? So you have this very advanced culture, but it's not a monotheistic culture, okay? It's not a monotheistic uh, worldview. Uh, in addition to that, and we'll explore this a little bit more in a minute, but there's, uh, there's a great deal of evidence in anthropology and ethnological studies uh, that show the evidence of, show the marks of a distinctive monotheism. And there are certain characteristics of monotheism that are distinctive. And there are certain aspects of that that are seen both in contemporary primitive cultures, 
today. So when they go into regions of the world where cultures are very primitive, they still see religions that have very distinct aspects of monotheism, as well as when they look back at cultures in history and they study cultures in ancient history, they see these marks of monotheism. So all of this, of course, tends to undermine this whole idea of uh, the evolutionary model. And then finally, it can be argued, if you're thinking in terms of sophistication and complexity, it could be argued that monotheism is simpler and less complex than, for example, animism or uh, polytheism. All right? So say, for example, you're a polytheist. Uh, say you're a Hindu. You have to deal with and you have to think through all these different gods that are affecting your life and you have to figure out how do I appease this one, how do I approach, uh, uh, propitiate this one, how do I get this God's favor. So it's, very, it's a very complex way to live. Whereas monothe in monotheism you just have one God, one set of rules, one set of laws, one God to worship, right? Uh, and one system of religious practices. So in one sense it could be argued that the simpler religion is not mana or animism, but the simplest religion actually is monotheism. Uh, so then in contrast to this evolutionary model, you have uh, presented uh, in uh, beginning in the kind of the middle of the 20th century, you have what we might call the original monotheism model, okay? And when I'm talking about original monotheism, I'm not trying to establish here uh, that it's actually the monotheism we see in the Bible. Of course, we believe it was, but that's not what I'm arguing for at this point, okay? Um, so you have the work uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century by this uh, brilliant uh, German uh, guy, he was, uh, or excuse me, Austrian guy, uh, he was a... Uh, uh, a linguist, he was an anthropologist, he was an ethnologist, he also happened to be a Catholic priest. And he just did this remarkable study on this question about religions and ancient religions and that sort of thing. And over the course of his life he kept adding and adding to his thesis. So by the time he got it done, it was 11,000 pages long, contained in 12 volumes, okay? And it was just absolutely groundbreaking work, and it really blows a hole in the whole evolutionary model. Now, there aren't very many scholars who have really dug in deep, in depth, into Schmidt's work for the obvious reason that to read through it is just a lot of work and to think through it. Uh, but, uh, but he developed uh, this original monotheism model, and he was actually expanding on the work of an earlier thinker uh, by the name of Andrew uh, Lang. And then uh, in more recent times, uh, just uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, it, it, the, his work has all been revisited by uh, Winfred Cordovan, who have, I've already mentioned and listed his two books in your resources. And particularly in his book, In the Beginning, God, he explores this whole idea of this evolutionary model and the original monotheism uh, model. And basically what Smith uh, was uh, seeking to establish, uh, or in order to establish what he was seeking to establish, he employed uh, a particular method of cultural historical research. This is just fascinating when you explore it and you read about it. It's just some fascinating research how he understand how he explores and researches how how populations moved and how em, uh, how emigration and immigration and uh, and the, just the movement of populations throughout history how they affect one another and that sort of thing. It's just fascinating uh, fascinating uh, work. Uh, and uh, so one of the things that he discovered as he kind of dug back through time, so to speak, <laughs> is that nearly every religious culture, even today, that nearly every religious culture shows some vestiges of monotheism. So wherever you go, <laughs> you're going to see elements of uh, this kind of monotheistic view. And, and I'll come back to that. What are those what are those characteristics of monotheism that, <clears throat> that he's talking about? But uh, for now, just to say that that's what he discovered as he, uh, as he goes back in time. Uh, 
Uh, also, he saw that cultures that advanced materially, as I mentioned, oftentimes regressed religiously from monotheism and back into these so-called uh, primitive religions. And we even see that today in America, right? So as America continues to advance technologically, scientifically, educationally, as a society, materially, we continue to advance. Actually, what is the trend we see in American religion? It's away from monotheism and back towards uh, polytheism, uh, Eastern mysticism, monism, which is another worldview we'll talk about coming up. So America, as a, as a, as a worldview, America is moving backwards towards these more primitive religions as it moves forward materially or technologically. Um, uh, and then, again, there are these elements of monotheistic religion that are detectable in cultures from every religion in the world. So wherever you go in the world, regardless of the development, the material development of those regions of the world, wherever you go in the world today, you can find these, some of these elements of monotheism. Uh, as well as in the most ancient cultures, okay, there were those that actually featured, and Schmidt and Cordowan uh, demonstrate this, there are features in most of the ancient, or in some ancient cultures, they clear, clearly see in the most ancient cultures, they see characteristics of this monotheistic worship. Uh, so the conclusion then of all of this work is that the anthropological, ethnological uh, evidence points towards monotheism as opposed to this idea of this kind of evolutionary model of the development of religion. And this is, of course, what we would expect if the Bible is true, right? We would expect that the most ancient uh, cultures, even ones that didn't believe in the God of the Bible, would still exhibit these kind of monotheistic uh, characteristics. Now, I want to be careful here. I don't want to argue that this is that, that the conclusion is rock solid here. In other words, and Corderman makes this point, he's not arguing that it's an open and shut case for monotheism being the original religion, approaching it from a strictly anthropological perspective, but he's saying that's where the evidence points. It points away from the evolutionary model and it points to uh, the monotheistic level, and he acknowledges that there's much more research, uh, certainly, that could be done and needs to be done. So what are these characteristics of early monotheism? And if we want to ask ourselves, well, if we wanted to know, if we wanted a really kind of clear picture of what did very early monotheists believe, a good place to look, of course, would be in the book of Genesis, right? And so if we do that, if we look at some of the characteristics of monotheism that we see in the book of Genesis, First of all, of course, we see that there is one God, hence monotheism, right? And that this God has personhood. We see that very clearly in Genesis. Uh, he's always referred to uh, in Genesis, of course, in the masculine gender. And this is a characteristic that Smith and Cordowan see in the most ancient cultures that exhibited monotheistic practices is that, that it typically the God was referred to in uh, the masculine gender. That doesn't mean that God is masculine, but that's how he was uh, referred to. Uh, third, God apparently lives in the sky or in heaven, so this is the idea of God being transcendent. Somehow he uh, transcends the world that we live in. Uh, God possesses great knowledge and power. God created the world. God is the source of standards of good and evil. Human beings are God's creatures, and so we are expected to live by God's standards. So uh, oftentimes in these very primitive monotheistic cultures, you see a very clear idea that God, uh, that there is not, not just that there is one God, but that he has a very high standard and that we are obligated or we are obliged to live by those standards of this monotheistic God. Uh, human beings have in some way become alienated from God uh, by violating his standards 
and that God has provided some method of overcoming that alienation or, or uh, removing that alienation. So these are some of the characteristics of early monotheism that we see, of course, in the book of Genesis in totality, but that you also see significant elements of this in other early uh, cultures. So, so what, we're, what we're attempting to do here is we're attempting to disarm the claim that people make that, well, religion is just the product uh, and your belief in God and Christianity, that's just the product of evolution, right? And so as, as you evolved, you developed these ideas and, and so your religious beliefs are just the product of uh, this evolutionary development. And so what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to be able to show people, now wait a minute, that model doesn't work when we look at the data. This whole concept of a monotheistic God appears to have existed in, uh, in the world from the beginning of the human race. Uh, so let's go on now and, and think about, uh, in the time we have left, let's think about uh, deism. Uh, and oftentimes people get deism and theism confused and they think they're the same thing, but there's really uh, a really quite a, quite a bit of uh, difference. So the history of deism actually goes back uh, to the 16th and 17th centuries when you have, uh, with the advent of modern, what we think of today as modern science, <laughs> you get a development of very strong rationalism, a very strong confidence in the ability of human reason. All right? And um, part of this move to deism was the result, particularly in Europe, of the decay of, uh, of Christian theism. So uh, if you're familiar at all with the Reformation, you know, of course, that the Reformation in the 16th century was a response to the decadence and the corruption within Catholicism, and that pervaded uh, of course, across Europe. And so, uh, so Christian theism, particularly among intellectuals, was really falling into, into disrepute. Uh, and uh, then, of course, then you have the, uh, you have the uh, Protestant Reformation, which kind of overthrows the, uh, the, uh, the hegemony of the ca uh, Catholic Church in Europe. And then subsequent to that, you have the wars, you have about 100 years of the so-called wars of religion. Uh, so you have a period of time there where Christian theism is really uh, kind of, uh, it's kind of shaky, all right? And this creates the vacuum then into which deism uh, can move. And so then you have, uh, you have this development of deism. But deism itself has its problems. So deism actually is, uh, Sire refers to it as a transitional worldview. So it's really a transition from Christian theism to what comes after deism. And deism just kind of fills the gap uh, between those. Um, and it's particularly uh, influential uh, during the period of the Enlightenment. So the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, particularly after the French Revolution, uh, it begins to really lose its influence. So it's really influ it, it kind of, like I say, it kind of comes in on the, uh, as, Christ as Christian theism is, is really struggling uh, among intellectuals, it comes in, it becomes very prominent, it becomes very influential during the Enlightenment era, and then you hit the, you hit the uh, French Revolution, which uh, exposed the, the, the foundational problems in Enlightenment thinking and, uh, and also in deism, and so then it tends to fade in its influence and other things come in, which we'll look at here in a minute. So, uh, so who are some key deist thinkers? Well, in the French Enlightenment, probably the first uh, the two that are uh, particularly well known are, of course, Voltaire uh, and Rousseau. Uh, both of them uh, were uh, deists, uh, and they tended towards what, what I'll call here in a minute cold deism. Um, both very influential in the Enlightenment. Rousseau was particularly influential 
uh, even though he died uh, well before the French Revolution, he was very, his thinking was very influential uh, in uh, the French Revolution. And then you have, you also have some key deist thinkers in the American aspect of the Enlightenment. So you had, you actually had a French Enlightenment, a British Enlightenment, and an American Enlightenment. And uh, the American thinkers were uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, among others, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine. These guys were all deists, okay? <clears throat> but as we'll see, there's a great deal of variety among deists. And so oftentimes people read things, for example, that Thomas Jefferson said, or that Benjamin Franklin said, well, then they say, oh, well, they were Christians, okay? But this is an actual, this is a confusion of what it is they're actually saying and where they're actually uh, coming from. Um, so, for example, uh, Thomas Jefferson was a deist, but he regularly, on every Sunday, attended church, which met in the House of Representatives on every Sunday, okay? This is after he, let, he read his, uh, wrote his letter talking about the wall of separation of church and state, okay? Uh, but, uh, so, he, uh, so he clearly was comfortable meeting with Christians, uh, participating with Christians in their worship services, although he was a deist, okay? So you just have to keep that in mind, that deism has a very wide scope to it. Uh, <clears throat> several of the features, primary features of uh, deism, one is there's this idea of the clockwork universe. So the idea is with the discovery of the laws of nature, the way nature operated, it was just concluded that okay, nature, uh, the, the world was created, it was created with these laws, and it was like, it was like a clock that was just kind of wound up and then just set on a shelf to run, okay? So that God created the, created the clock, he created the world, but he's pretty much just kind of set it on a shelf and he's letting it kind of run itself out, okay? Uh, you actually see elements of this uh, even with uh, Christians today, uh, who are uh, theistic evolutionists. Now, they, they wouldn't adhere to deism. They clearly, uh, clearly profess Christian faith. Uh, and yet there's this kind of idea of this clockwork universe that God just set it in place and, and the whole world is just unfolding without God's uh, interference in the daily, daily affairs of the universe. Okay? Uh, as I said, there's just a great deal of variation. So you'll get what we might call a, a warm deist, okay? So a warm deist might have some kind of limited sense of God's personality and even to some degree of God's involvement in the world. So if you read the American deist thinkers, uh, oftentimes they will refer to God's activity in the world. So there's some sense that God is active, but there's, a comp but there's still this dismissal of any idea of miraculous intervention, things like that. Uh, then you have a, a, a more rigid or cold deism, okay? And in this case, uh, God's pretty much devoid of any, any kind of personality. Uh, he's just kind of this transcendent force or energy out there. He's called the prime mover, you know, the, uh, the first cause or whatever. But that's about as far as they'll go uh, in, in their explication of God. Uh, so that uh, God is, uh, with many deists, and again, not all, but with many deists, God is not sovereign. Uh, he's not providential. He's not acting in the world every day. He's not directing the, the affairs of the world, uh, as we might think of uh, in Christian theism. Uh, he's transcendent, okay, but he's not imminent. Imminent is this idea of being present or being near. God is distant. He's, uh, he is transcendent, but there is no eminence with God. And he is, uh, in cold deism, he's impersonal and, uh, and largely unknowable. There's, we really can't know much about him. We can look at creation and we can conclude that God created the cosmos, he created the world, uh, but, uh, but there's really not much that we can know about God. He's pretty, uh, he's pretty uh, unknowable. Uh, and up until, up until uh, the Enlightenment and up until the, the uh, development of deism, the, the prevalence of deism, Christians viewed 
reason as important, but they, but they viewed revelation as, as the ultimate authority, okay? Uh, and what happens with deism is that reason replaces revelation as the ultimate authority. So as Christians, we view reason as necessary, but not sufficient in our knowledge of God and God's workings. Okay, so we have to have reason, but reason by itself is not sufficient, okay? Uh, so for example, we've got this television screen here and we've got, we've got an image up there, okay? And I've got an electrical cord running to it and that electrical cord is necessary for the image, right? But it's not sufficient. You need a whole lot more than the cord, right? So in Christianity, we view, we view reason as necessary, but not sufficient for our knowledge of God. What we need in addition to reason is we need uh, revelation. But deism, uh, deism eliminates the need for revelation and relies strictly on reason. Uh, then as far as the cosmos is concerned, uh, Deus typically believe it was created by God, but then again, he kind of set it on the shelf. He's really not involved in it. So how things unfold in the world, how history unfolds, is really just predetermined from the way things were first created. Uh, and then, of course, there are no miracles. There is no divine revelation or certainly nothing that we could establish that we know for sure is divine revelation. <coughs> And then the whole idea of, of humanness and what it means to be human, particularly when you think about life after death, is you get a lot of variety with deists. So some deists will believe that there's life after death and other, others won't. Uh, but what ultimately happens with deism is because that idea of the image of God is lost, there's a diminishing of the value of human life and human beings. Uh, and this is, of course, one of the primary things that led to the incredible violence of the French Revolution, is just the value of human life had been lost, and so that just opened the door for the bloodletting of uh, the French Revolution. Uh, again, the basis for values is human reason, as I've said, and uh, history is viewed as linear, as we as theists view it, but it's all, as I said, it's determined. There's there, uh, human, uh, human free will and that sort of thing is precluded. And again, I have to emphasize, when you talk, if you read a deist from the past or if you happen to encounter a deist today, you're going to get a lot of variety on these. And well, I don't believe that or I do believe that or whatever. So again, you have to really listen to people and pay attention to what, I, what they say. Now, as I said, deism was, uh, an uh, uh, had a level of instability in it, and some of the reasons for that is because deism is based on autonomous human reason, then we get to define God the way we are, w the way he is. So we say what God is through human reason, and then as human reason changes, our view of God changes. So deism starts out with a particular view of God, but then that view of God is in flux and that creates an instability with, within the whole deistic worldview. Uh, and again, uh, and again this, you have the same thing re regarding values and ethics, all right? So autonomous human reason defines what things are valuable, what values are, uh, what, ethics, uh, uh, what ethics are, and so all of that then becomes pliable, becomes uh, variable depending on uh, the, uh, the foibles of human reasoning. Uh, generally speaking, deism rejects uh, the idea of the fall, so, and everything is determined, so whatever is, is right. Okay? So just whatever the way things are, that's just the way things should be because that's uh, determinist, so there's no real content for us. That's not to say that deists aren't ethical people, but they have no fundamental, uh, they have no foundation for those ethics uh, philosophically. Uh, and so, of course, that leads to instability. Uh, furthermore, the universe is a closed system, so human actions are determined, and so again, as I mentioned, human significance is diminished, 
And then this whole idea of a clockwork universe, as science proceeds, particularly as we get into this whole issue of quantum mechanics and how things, how things behave at the quantum level, at the level of atoms and subatomic particles, uh, this whole idea of a clockwork universe kind of begins to crumble. So, uh, so these are all things that eventually uh, undermine deism and so deism then starts to give away by the early part of the 19th century and then you start getting all these other e uh, isms that kind of come in in the place so you get uh, you get atheism uh, begins to grow nihilism postmodernism uh, existentialism all these other isms come in because deism has replaced theism and then it crumbles and then all these other ideas and philosophies begin to gain ground. Okay, uh, So Sire points out that even though it has lost a lot of weight within our culture, there are still uh, some expressions, some ways we'll see it uh, today. And one is what he called sophisticated scientific de deism, which is scientists who adhere to a belief in some kind of higher power, some kind of God or whatever, but they pretty well just deny his active role. So there are a number of scientists you'll talk to who will say, well, yes, I believe in God, but I don't believe that we can see his hand at act, uh, in action in the world today or, uh, or in the progress of life or the development of life and things like that. And then within the philosophical realm, you have what he calls sophisticated philosophical deism, uh, which is, again, the, the idea with some philosophers that there is a God, he is personal, he is the source of morality, but we really can't know him, he doesn't reveal himself, and we really can't know him, so, uh, so he's just kind of a vague God out there. And then probably the one we're going to encounter most often is what uh, Sire refers to as moralistic therapeutic deism. And it's just what it sounds like. It's kind of a deism that has kind of a morality to it and is largely therapeutic. In other words, it just makes us feel better, right? Uh, so, so this is kind of the, the grandfather view of God, right? So God is up there. He's kind of a grandfatherly character. Uh, he really isn't involved in my daily life. And he's really not all that bugged if I do some things that, you know, unless I do something really horrible, you know, God's just really not bothered by those things. He's not petty. Uh, he's just that grandfather up there. But if I really get in trouble, <laughs> if I really need something, you know, if I, you know, if I'm dying of cancer, you know, or if I'm, you know, if I really need this, you know, I really need this girl to like me or whatever, then this kind of grandfatherly deistic God is out there and I can pray and, and maybe he'll answer and he'll help me. And so these are kind of some contemporary views of deism that we're uh, uh, very likely uh, to encounter, even though deism as a moving intellectual force uh, is not uh, noticeably strong in our culture today. So that's theism and deism. I trust you can see the difference between the two. Uh, and now uh, then next week uh, we want to go on, and I want to spend two weeks on Islam because that's an area that a lot of us think a lot about. We have to deal with a lot. So I wonder if we want to take some time to try and understand uh, Islam and the Islamic worldview. So that's what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. Okay? <laughs>